Thank you for joining me for a cocktail conversation, but it's a cocoa conversation today because it's a it's a bit of a holiday movie and and we want people of all ages and to be able to enjoy a little mug of something on a chilly winter night, depending where you are in the country. Um, it might be chilly, it might be sort of warm, but I'm so excited that you're with us. Um, I wanted to take uh, a minute to just say thank you for joining us on this project. Uh, it would not be anything near what it is without your help and your artistic vision. And um, so if if we, and I'm, I'm, I'm loving playing with my background. This is the Edward Tulane sort of starry background. I don't have anything quite as adventurous as your studio to broadcast from today. So um, I wanted to put a little Edward in here, but it's, it's doing funny things with my hand when I. Oh, you're kind of going in and out. It's a little grains. So for those who are joining us, I'm, I'm talking today with Aaron Pollock, who is uh, the animator and in many ways the the sort of visual director of um, the Edward Tilling Choral Suite that we released last week. And in trying to think about, you know, what we wanted to spotlight about this project, um, it occurred to me that we should really just sit down and, and talk with Aaron because uh, some of us are familiar a bit with the music and libretto that Paolo Prestini and Mark Campbell crafted for the opera. Um, but this is an entirely new process for, for us as an opera company um, to be able to work with someone with your many, many different skill sets um, and craft something like this is, is brand new. So thank you for being with us. Um, not just for this, but for the project as well. Um, I'm curious, just if, if you could take me back to, uh, you get a call from Paola Prestini who says, I have this unusual project that I want to talk with you about. And what, what made it something that you wanted to join, that you felt like you had something to offer, uh, as Paola described it to you? Well, I mean, I had just come off of a project with her. Um, uh, that I did animation for a short opera piece um, last summer and it was amazing and she's a genius so you know I was ready to say yes just because her I mean for one thing her music is so fun to animate too yeah because there's so many layers of information and stuff going on and just like to like use that as a guide for some of the movements and rhythm of the animation is there's just a lot to pull from. So I was ready to say yes based on that. But then I bought the book and um, read it. And then I got the audio book and listened to it like maybe five times. Oh my gosh. And immediately, I just felt like, and she said this when she invited me, but I didn't understand until I read it what a good match it would be for sort of my way of storytelling and sort of the um, ideas and things that I'd been working with in my own work before this. So it was, a, it seemed like kind of a kismet. And good, yeah. so what led, because I think my only real experience with stop motion animation is uh, like holiday classic films that I grew up watching, wow. you know, whether it was Rudolph or uh, is that the one that has Hermie the dentist? uh the, the elf with the little blonde thing that one he, he was working for santa but he, anyway not important <laughs> but um i just i i loved those pieces and i they were so magical then but i really hadn't interacted with much stop motion animation except for like music videos and things like that that i'd seen from time to time how did you find your way into this art form um, well, I mean, it was rather recently. I've only been doing it since like, I fell down a rabbit hole with it. It's more appropriate now than before. Uh, in like 2018, uh, early 2018, I started um, sort of playing around with, yeah, yeah. I mean, so I was in school at the time and I, I, I guess I, Kind of, there was a, an instructor who um, we had been talking about that kind of work and how it might be a good match for me. And, um, and then it was like one step in and then I just like 
gone. It was such a good, but because my historically I've, I've been making art full time since I was, well, since 2004. Um, but it was mostly drawing, painting, sculpture, some like big public art sculpture, but some photography a little bit. Um, but it was always felt like those disciplines were sort of separate. And I had to like, be like, okay, I'm doing this now yeah. and animation. And, but so there's that. And the fact that I was always dealing with time, the way I've, the way, best way I found to describe this to people is I was making paintings for many years that were like layers and layers of stories and things that had happened. But I was the only person who was witnessing <laughs> what yep. was underneath each layer. And so people just saw what was on top. And, and uh, animation is kind of like being able to turn that and like accordion out the whole process and every mark is sort of revealed. But also I get to use painting and sculpture and drawing and photography and all the things in one in one world building. Magic. It's just amazing. And I, I'd seen some of your work previously, but I, you, you used so many different styles of animation in this project. Um, and I'm, I'm yeah, curious. I wanted to use some more <laughs> random yeah. time. <laughs> did you had a, did you have a, a favorite scene or a, um, mm. of the ones you worked on? Um, I mean, there's like little, there's a few moments throughout. I think the underwater scene was really fun to build that world. Um, but also the, the, you know, the ship um, in um, Quite a Fine Day, the second song mm -hmm. in there um, uh, was oil paint on top of a black oil paint and green oil paint on top of a green, like, chroma screen like the, they use for the weatherman mm -hmm. so I could kind of use the green paint to like erase into some other layer of yeah. information and um that was a really that was the first time I've done that kind of process so that was really fun and I have I had visions for doing lots more with that but next time uh, <laughs> but yeah the underwater scene was really fun um to build out because it was basically, I can show you actually, if you want to yeah, see. I'd, I'd love to see like how, how you would have worked on that. Yeah, let's see if I can turn. Okay, don't mind the chaos everywhere. <laughs> uh, so this was the scene. Um, and then I had a green screen back here that got cut out. Um, but basically, there, this is just like stuff from, if I can light it better so you can actually see it. Well, that, that light's a little intense for this purpose, but anyway, it's, it's just stuff from like a thousand different projects and it's so many different materials from when I was making molds of Edward uh -huh. and his puppet and stuff. And then the movement was, I'll see if I can scoop this. There's like, uh, space underneath this stage um, where I had tools that stuck out and I could move like the grass and stuff like oh, that. Oh yeah, look at that. So, so that would be, and so it's just between each photograph, it would just get like a little movement or it would be like this. And then I would like spin something and move it and drop this and then take another picture. Wow. <laughs> and blow some stuff around this wasn't here and you know tweak it and then the way I was lighting it I'll show you the uh I had a series of flashlights of different temperatures like colder and warmer light and so yeah. as I was taking the the photographs I would move these around as sort of spotlights to reveal different areas of it Amazing. Um, yeah. Oops. Erin, as you're, as you're thinking through a, a scene, how many different, you know, like you must have so many frames per second when you're animating something. Is there a, a range that you're always shooting for to make sure you have a certain number of images? 
Yeah, so I, I aim for, I shoot in planning for 24 frames per second. Um, and then depending on how it needs to change for the music and other things, it gets sped up and slowed down. Um, and yeah, I mean, originally when we talked about this, it was supposed to be, I was gonna make eight minutes of like active animation and then stills. Right. But I just had so much fun working on, I got quite carried away. <laughs> so I did more than that, which meant that I had to um, uh, slow some of them down even more to, yeah. to make them last. But yeah, that's the ballpark. It was also interesting to me because this was not, although the melodies um, and some of the choral work are familiar to those of us that have worked on the opera proper, mm -hmm. um, what Paola designed with this was a computer generated sound world. And so to have something that was very high technology on the one side is sort of the audio sound bed that we listen to and have something that is clearly um, requires a great deal of detail and, and you are building and painting and I mean, it's it's very tactile. It's 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 the opposite of of digital and high tech. It is it is cra like true craftsmanship and artistry that you're putting into all of these different images. And I I found the juxtaposition of having that um, sort of soundscape be one side of our sort of interest point, and and your work being the opposite of that to be such an interesting marriage. Was there anything about that that changed how you approached your work on this piece? Um, yeah, I think in the, um, there were certain songs, I'm trying to think of a good example of one, um, that, well, like the Welcome to the Dollhouse had uh, so many f strange, like found, I assume found sounds and, um, just layers of wild <laughs> noises. And uh, that one was very fun. I did something I don't often do with that one, which was I actually animated at least the first part of it to the music frame mm -hmm. for frame. So I was able to pull the music into the animating timeline. And, you know, I was able to line up the mouth um, of the doll speaking at the beginning and then was trying to hit certain percussive moments with the movements and the animation. Um, yeah, it gives, it's a very generous thing to um, uh, like creative um, impetus kind of, you know, yeah. some cool parameters. So do you have, um, did you keep either Edward or Abilene? Do you, are they around? Yeah, I mean, there's a few versions of Edward. I can, I'll carry you over there. I can see if um, he, you know, he gets pretty beat up in the process. Yes, he does. <laughs> and, you know, who doesn't when they're learning to love, right? Yep. Um, okay, so here, well, these are all the dolls. Oh my gosh, yeah. Up. I don't know how good my camera on my thing is here. But, um, oh, and here's the old doll from... Um, that uh, open your heart scene. Yeah. yeah. Um, but so here, down here. And she's is... really like not bigger than your hand. Nope, she's a little tiny, little tiny gal. Wow. And her feet never showed, so those didn't get built. <laughs> yep. um, but she, so here are, well, here's a lot of different people's hands. Mm -hmm. um, and then back here, we, this is Abilene. She yeah. also got fairly beat up in all of this. Yeah. Um, this is one, this is Edward with his <laughs> repaired um, face after the fact. Um, this is bottom of the ocean, Edward, um, pre-repair, pre-damage. Um, and he's got like the, the detritus and stuff from yep. the bottom of the ocean scene sort of embedded yep. in his skin. Here's this, this scary doll from... Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> the doll shop scene and then here i've got i actually did not um get get to the point where i got to 
fully do this scene the way I wanted to, but I made all these prototypes of Edwards um, for to get his head cracked open and then repaired. And I um, found out this was the one I would, perhaps next time we'll do it with where he's held together by this green, which whatever, that's a maybe a technically boring thing to explain. But anyway, I don't think so. I, I think that's really interesting. That. <laughs> we, we actually did have a question come in just before you went over to your table about how do you film the animation where Edward was shattered and, and put back together? Is that, are you filming in reverse? Are you filming? Well, so I, I did not animate the scene where he actually um, falls, where his head gets broken because yeah. um, just wasn't enough time, but the putting it back together, I did in reverse. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It was so uh, great. And how did you, how did you take your cues for, you know, between the book and I know you saw some of the sketches from uh, the from the production and but ha, you know you have to put your own spin on that so how much of that is is inspiration and intuition and how do you, you make know, those decisions? I, I mean I think for me intuition is always a huge um, it's a thing that I, it's sort of my religion <laughs> in some ways. It's a nervous uh, way to work sometimes because you just kind of hope that things work out. For this project, I, I did do much more storyboarding and planning in advance because there was so much I wanted to cover. Um, and, you know, I wanted the mute, I wanted it to fit with the music um, in a, a generative way um and i didn't want to leave that fully up to chance but there was quite a lot of um of intuition in terms of what the characters came to look like and the the way the materials all came together um i, I mean i've i've i these songs are in my brain for the end of time i've heard them so many times um it's, yeah, it's such beautiful music, but I, between that and, you know, I've, I've listened through the book probably at least 10 times all, all said and done. And so I've, I, these characters live in my brain um, and have been living in my brain and kind of growing and revealing themselves for, since last yeah. summer. You, you mentioned um, different kinds of materials that you work with and and there were at least three or four different sort of mediums that I noticed in the course of the of the choral suite. Um, how what what is your how do you find what you want to work with? Do you use the same thing all the time? Are you constantly introducing new things? How how do you decide what makes it what makes the cut in terms of the materials you're using to build with? Um, well, I I I always admire people who you know, identify as minimalist, but I am not one of them. <laughs> I am like a wholehearted maximalist. So my studio is full of every material you can use to make anything, uh, which occasionally can be paralyzing because it's like there's 30 options for any given thing. Yeah. Um, but, you know, this one, there wasn't much of a struggle on that. It was just like the materials came in that, that um, were useful to do the thing that I needed each character or uh, set to do. Um, I'm trying to think. There, there is. Uh, I'll show you something kind of funny on here. Um, there's also like some scale. I mean, the thing that's kind of fun about. Um, Yeah, there's like 30 things I want to tell you. I'm trying to decide which thing is like, yeah. You know. um, but like, there's plenty of working this way. It's sort of like Western facades, you know, and or like, uh, I guess, Hollywood sets where there's just like, you only finish what is seen. So there's like, you know, this scene was ended up being a still in the thing, but it was like, you only saw this part of his face. Right. Um, so he's got this like terrifying rest of the body that didn't need to get finished. He's like a little uh, cyborg character. Uh-huh. There's a few of those around. 
Um, but also uh, like dealing with scale, like the, the little doll, um, you know, you saw the size of her. Um, but then like, this is the fisherman's wife who also oh, yeah. you really only needed um, to see, well, she got kind of destroyed a little bit, but you only needed to see part of her. Yeah. So otherwise just like a ball of floof. Yeah. I often use, I mean, I, when I want there to be expression in the faces, um, like an oil-based clay is the thing because it never dries and you can just keep smooshing. Keep um, it malleable. Yeah. It, yeah. Um, but I'm trying to think, do you want to see the tiny food from the diner? That's made out of something. Uh, yeah. Different. Yeah. This oh, it's, all... it's like the whole diner counter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was well, actually this one was Nellie's. Um, oh right. Counter. Um, but so these were made out of just that like um, Sculpey, you know, the oven bake clay that people make like little kids make jewelry out of. So there's a little salad. Wow. This is um. This uh, steak and eggs. <laughs> So great. Little, uh, oops. A little stack of pancakes and butters on top. Um, Amazing. This was Nellie's um, little. Right. A little flour um, mixing yeah. bowl. Mm hmm. A little mug. So, I mean, it's all different. There's a lot of different materials that go into it that are. Oh, I can show you actually. Um, I wonder. So that's the house. Yeah. I'll bring you a little closer. Um, so, um, so this is all, all of the brick and stonework and stuff is all made out of um, clay. Wow. Um, and this, uh, yeah, all this is clay, styrofoam. Styrofoam turns out is a really good material for snow. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and these little lights turn on. Oop, well, not like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a lot of like, oh, here were some, mm, let's see, fish parts. Oh yeah. <laughs> those were, those were to be used differently, but they were on Nellie's um, um, top. <laughs> yeah. Um, but Oh, here is this. A lot of things are made, you know, oh. they just have, it's just styrofoam and fabric. You know, they just have to function well enough. And light is a major sculptural element. With yeah, so I was going to say, that's the, the one thing that, that was unexpected to me. And I don't know why, because it's, you're doing a miniature theatrical version of, a story and so but one of the things that jumped out at me when I watched it probably the second or third time was the the way that you lit each of the scenes had its own had its own light plan yeah. um is that something that when you are storyboarding you're already thinking about how you will light it or that's something that happens in the moment yeah, that's probably one of the more intuitive parts of it because I can have a plan for what I think will work and then you try it and you get it, you know, the camera loaded up showing you on the monitor and it's just boring, you know, or it's just like there's or something or you sort of set it up haphazardly with the intention of changing it and you see some accidental like shadow drop that's actually better and more compelling than whatever I had thought of. So that part is sort of on the fly, but I will set everything up and often spend like an hour just moving lights around until oh it, until it clicks. And, and I know this is deeply personal because you can tell in the le level of detail that you're, that you work um, into the, the project, but do you have help? Do you have like stage managers and assistants and 
when you're moving lights, do you have people helping move lights? And are you I'm, doing absolutely everything <laughs> on your own? I'm doing absolutely everything to the point where it's like, um, there's, there's, there are days when I wish that there was a hidden camera because it gets pretty funny when I am, I'm also stubborn and I'm like the kind of person who doesn't take three trips, you know, yeah. I'm like, I got it. <laughs> so there's, um, yeah, it's a quite a physical, ends up being quite a physical job because yeah. of all of those things. Um, I like the idea of having uh, assistants or interns or helpers, but I, I think maybe I'm too much of a control freak and I'm not, maybe so I wouldn't be very good at deferring any of those little yeah. decisions. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, we had a question come in about if you're building something that has no point of reference, if you're building something from scratch or creating a piece of art um, from your own imagination, is there a different approach that you take on a project like this where there, I mean, this book is pretty iconic for a whole generation of families. And so you, I don't know whether you had any preconceived notions about how you needed to treat the characters or how they should look or feel or because they are so, those characters are already so personal to so many readers. Um, right. How does that affect your process? Well, I mean, I think the, what's cool about books is that they're really personal to everyone that reads them. But if all of those people could draw or, illust, you know, ex show you what those characters looked like to them, none of them would look the same. Yep, exactly. So, you know, I think I just had to trust that whatever, you know, came through the filter of my life and um, tendencies and aesthetics uh, was the most, I mean, that's like, it's a cliched thing, but the best way to get at something universal is to approach it very specifically. Yes. You know, from your own actual experience instead of yeah. being like vague. So, I mean, maybe maybe there's people that will look at the way I, I rendered these characters and be like, well, that's not right. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's right for I, me. I remember when we first started talking with Kate uh, mm -hmm. about whether she would allow us to transform the book into an opera. Um, and she was very interested in what someone else's perception of her story would be. She mm -hmm. was not at all... Uh, terribly precious about specificity and what in what a character had to look or or sound like it was about you know the story itself and is that being preserved and um and then I remember later in the process she said oh I, somewhere I have a photo of the toy rabbit that inspired Edward Tulane mm -hmm. and I said oh I would love to see that and the only images I had seen were the illustrations in the book you know, or on the cover of the book, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And um, and then I saw the photo of the rabbit that sh that inspired her. Nothing like that <laughs> at <laughs> <Yeah>. all. <laughs> and I I was sort of uh, just in again inspired by how free she was to allow us to sort of continue the story and and let it be someone else's. Yeah. Um, She's such a, a generous artist that way with her with her writing and with her storytelling. Yeah. Well, and for that reason, I did feel like, you know, she gives enough information. There's some like descriptive clues throughout the book. And I was very I, I felt like I needed to take those into account throughout. Yeah. You know, they weren't um, they didn't narrow anything, but I felt like I needed to do some justice to them. So well, I know you're going to uh, get some vacation time soon. Um, after having worked on this so diligently for us for a while now, I'm happy that you get a little time <laughs> over the holidays to relax. And uh, you said you were headed to Alaska to get in some snow. That sounds exciting. Um, yeah, that's great. But, you know, just thank you again. Is, is there um, anything that you would like to leave us with in terms of a thought? If we, if we want to go back and view it again, is there something that you would like us to think about on a second or third viewing or uh, or a, or something that inspired you about the creative process that you'd like to leave folks with as they watch the Tulane Choral Suite uh, over the holidays? I 
gosh, that's I wish I I wish I had like a really smart thought right now, but I don't know if I do. Uh, you know, I think watch it with a kid and have the kid explain things to you is usually like I find that pretty um enlightening. Kids I agree. sometimes know stuff that we don't. Um and they've got more active or less less limitations on yes. the way they interpret the world and it's and to listen to listen to how a child is able to um interpret art they have so much less filters and yeah you know sort of um nothing performative about it it's just what they're feeling yes um is there a is there an age group that you did you craft this for anyone of any age? Did you craft it for specific age of, of children or families or what? Did you have anything like that in mind? Um, not necessarily. I mean, I, I think, you know, I'm not going to deny that my work tends to, there's like a dark edge to it, but I think that I've always thought like maybe I could, there's a sort of tr uh, tripod of like, uh, sentimental, silly, and dark. And I can like keep, I can, if I stay on all three of them, I can get away with more. So yeah. it doesn't get sappy or scary or whatever. Um, but I think, you know, it's interesting. There are, uh, adults that I've had respond to my work and, and tell me like, it's too weird or scary for them. Um, and then like five-year-olds that like get it <laughs> yep. that are like we have really cool conversations about it and vice versa so i think it's just for anybody who responds to it yeah, yeah. well i love it and i'm so grateful to you i know our, our creative team is happy that we found you and that it helped us especially in this particular moment we had no way to forecast what was going to be happening uh, with the continuing health crisis and um so to have something that that we can connect to this story uh, before we present it on stage, uh, hopefully within uh, a short period here. Uh, can't, can't give away all the clues quite yet, um, but, uh, but it means a great deal that you'd be willing to work on this with us. And it just came out beautifully. So thank you so much. Well, thank you for the invitation. It's been a real honor. It's been such a fun project. Great. I'm glad. Have fun vacation and a great holiday. And we'll see you yeah. again soon. Next year. <laughs> Take care. See you too. Bye-bye.